Hello, my name is Mr. Eichert. I'm an AP World History teacher. Welcome to my world, the world of Eichert, where we learn how to think like the College Board. And people that can think like the College Board get fives on their AP exams. Today's topic is developments in East Asia, and we're going to look at both the content and the skills that you need to master this topic. So students, are you ready? I was born ready. I'm so excited to increase my knowledge. Then let's proceed. Here's a list of all the key terms that we're going to cover today. But before we do that, let's talk about the historical themes. Um, Mr. Eichard, I didn't have time to write all that down. No need to worry, all of these vocab terms are time stamped in this video for your convenience. I wasn't worried. But we don't just want to go cramming a bunch of vocab. I love cramming vocab. In order to think like the College Board and get a five. You need to know how to organize this information in your brains. Fortunately, the College Board has told us exactly how to do this inside the course and exam description, the CED. First, we have the three history reasoning processes, the three C's, comparison, causation, and continuity and change over time. Next, we've got the six themes, sometimes using the acronym PIECES. You need all of the pieces to get the full picture or my personal preference, spice tea. Spicy. When you're studying content, you should always be thinking about both the three C's of history reasoning processes and the six themes, pieces or spice tea. This video will show you how to do that and how to apply it to the information from topic 1.1. So East Asia, 1200 to 1450. It's a big topic and it covers a lot of ground. How do we know what we should be focusing on? Well, once again, we should take a look at the CED unit guides. So let's follow along. All right, so let's take a look at this page, 1.1 in the unit guides. So this part right here basically just lets us know our first theme to look at is governance, which we call political. Here's our learning objective, explain the systems of government employed by Chinese dynasties and how they developed over time. So how they developed over time, that should give us a clue that we're going to look at a lot of continuity and change over time. This section here is just an introduction to Unit 1, how there's different states, which we'll look at in later videos. This includes the Song Dynasty of China, which utilized traditional methods of Confucianism and an imperial bureaucracy to maintain and justify its rule. So right away, we know that we're talking about the Song Dynasty. So that that means our first key term is the Song Dynasty. It started in 960 and it lasted till 1279. It was preceded by the Tang and followed by the Yuan, divided into the Northern Song and Southern Song periods. Now you might notice that it's a bit on the small side in terms of territory, especially when compared with other dynasties like the Sui and the Tang. Actually, throughout its whole history, the Song Dynasty was actually sharing China with other dynasties, such as the Jin Dynasty and the Western Xia. But even though it was comparatively small, the Song Dynasty is still widely considered to be a golden age for China because of its highly organized and sophisticated government institutions, rapid economic development, flourishing arts and culture, and technological innovations. Our next key term is the dynastic cycle. This is the process of the rise and fall of different dynasties in China throughout history. A key concept in the dynastic cycle is the idea of the mandate of heaven, basically approval from heaven or the cosmos that Chinese emperors use to maintain and justify their rule. The Chinese emperors were referred to as the son of heaven, and they represented the divine on the earth. If people submit themselves to the emperor's authority and obey his laws, then there will be peace and prosperity. But when a dynasty starts to decline and peace and prosperity are no longer guaranteed, then natural disasters and rebellions occur. And then you could say that that dynasty has lost the mandate of heaven. Then you got some new guys coming in and they set up a new dynasty. And now it would appear that they're the ones that have the mandate of heaven. And then their dynasty starts to decline, and then you have rebellions, and then the cycle goes on and on. This concept of the dynastic cycle and the mandate of heaven had existed all the way back to the Zhou dynasty, which is more than 2,000 years before the Song, and that means it's about 3,000 years before today. And this remained constant all the way up until the Qing dynasty. Mr. Eichert, is this an example of a continuity? Yes, a super important example of continuity. And also change. Yes, 
because each time that you have a new dynasty, that's definitely an example of political change. Not only did the Song claim the mandate of heaven, so did the Jin and the Western Shah, all at the same time. So let's take a quick look at the Jin and the Shah as kind of a combined key term. You really only need to know a few general things about these guys. They were both led by nomadic or semi-nomadic peoples whose leaders were not ethnic Chinese. Though these barbarians, as the Song referred to them, competed and often fought for territory with the Song, there were also many peaceful interactions, especially involving trade and tribute. But that's enough about them, so let's get back to the Song Dynasty, and our next key term is, is that all we're gonna say about the Jin and the Western Xia? Well, unfortunately for them, they're just not that big of a deal on the AP World History Modern exam. If the college board don't care about them, I don't care about them. As we were saying, our next political term is the imperial bureaucracy. So let's break it down. At the top, there's an emperor. He's the head of state, the son of heaven. And he's got a vast network of government officials, bureaucrats, that work for him. All throughout the empire, in virtually every aspect of life, there are these government bureaucrats. And they're broken down according to these six different ministries. At the top of these ministries is something called the censorate, and their job is basically just to check on the other ministries and make sure that they're doing their jobs correctly and properly. As much as 20,000 different officials worked directly for the central government during the Song Dynasty. Now, China's not the only state to have bureaucracy. What is different is two things. The scale of it, how many people there are, how huge this bureaucracy is. The other thing is how centralized it is. The Song Dynasty was by far the most sophisticated, most complex, and most centralized government of any in the world. And by the way, this had also been the case for many of the earlier dynasties all the way back to the Qin Dynasty in the 3rd century BC, China's highly centralized bureaucracy developed. The Qin, the Han, the Tang, and the Sui all had the most centralized and sophisticated governments, the most advanced economies, and the most people of any states in their own time periods. Mr. Eichert, are you saying that's another example of a change over time? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. So who exactly are all of these people working in this vast bureaucracy? Well, that takes us to our next key term, scholar officials, also referred to as scholar bureaucrats. These are people whose positions are based on their passing different levels of the civil service exam which is another important key term that goes along with this one, so we're going to put them together. The idea was that the more you studied and did well on these exams, the higher government positions you could get. Sounds like a government run by nerds. <laughs> I wish I was in the Song Dynasty. And what exactly are they studying on these civil service exams? Well, knowledge of many things, including law, poetry, calligraphy, essay writing, government structure and politics, classic literature, speaking, mathematics. Much of the content on these exams was influenced by Confucianism, and more specifically something called Neo-Confucianism. And since you know we're talking about ethical and belief systems, you should know that we're on to our next theme, which is culture. All right, before we get into that, let's just take a quick look at what the CED has for culture. Okay, let's go right to the learning objective, which is to explain the effects of Chinese cultural traditions on East Asia over time. All right, so we're looking at how China influences all of East Asia, which is basically China itself and Korea and Japan. And again, over time, so we're gonna look at a lot of continuities and some changes. Yes, we see over here, these traditions continued and they influence neighboring regions. So we're gonna be doing a lot of continuities. We're also talking about Buddhism. How does Buddhism shape societies in Asia? And also the variety of branches, schools, and practices. So over here, you see they list these different branches. So we'll spend a little time on these three. Also, we look up here, filial piety, Neo-Confucianism and Buddhism, Confucian traditions, how it affects women, and also Chinese literary and scholarly traditions and their spread to Heian, Japan, and Korea. So we wanna cover all of these things today. So there's a lot. But first, back to Confucianism. Hopefully you've already heard about Confucius because Confucianism is another big continuity in Chinese history, but perhaps you forgot about him. So to recap, Confucius taught about the two important virtues of Ren and Li. Ren is about being kind to each other and avoiding conflict, promoting peace, and good relations among people. Li is basically about everything and everyone being in their right place and doing things in the proper way. A key part of this propriety in Confucian thinking is the concept of 
filial piety. This is the Confucian idea that we should honor and obey our ancestors and parents. Filial piety was also convenient for the government because it trained people how to be obedient. Actually, the Confucian concept of the five relationships treats the obedience of the subject to the ruler much in the same way as children obeying their parents or wives obeying their husbands. But this obedience to the higher level from the lower level doesn't come for free. In order to earn this obedience, the emperor and the scholar officials who work for him have to demonstrate benevolence. So do you see how cultural and political themes are influencing each other? You should be seeing that. Got it. Another aspect of Confucianism's influence on Chinese society is how it affected women. According to Confucian beliefs, women were supposed to be submissive, humble, and delicate, and they definitely weren't supposed to go outside their homes. However, in alignment with both the concepts of Ren and Li, everyone was also supposed to treat women with a certain degree of respect and not take advantage of them or abuse them. But women clearly had an inferior role in society as defined by Confucianism. A peculiar practice that originated in the Song Dynasty was the practice of foot binding. Now, without going into too much detail, foot binding is the practice of breaking the bones in young girls' feet to make them smaller so that they can fit into tiny shoes. Although this wasn't something that Confucius himself had talked about, this idea of foot binding went along with the Confucian ideals of female submission. Of course, during this time, Confucianism's not the only big belief system in China. Another cultural continuity in Song China is the persistence of both Taoism and Buddhism. Taoism was founded in China by Laozi around the same time as Confucius. You don't need to know too much about Taoism other than that it teaches people that truth and wisdom can be found by seeking harmony with nature, as well as the concept of yin and yang, opposite but complementary forces. Taoists were also avid alchemists, and they're the ones who were always making different concoctions to try to make people live forever. One unfortunate example was their recommendation to the first emperor, Qin Shi Huangdi of the Qin Dynasty, to drink mercury. It didn't work out. But they accidentally discovered gunpowder, so I guess that was more positive? It wasn't all mad scientist stuff, though. You should think of the Taoists as being very interested in understanding the secrets of the natural world. Also, Taoism tended to have a more favorable view of women and held them in a more prominent position in society. Now on to Buddhism. Basically, Buddhism's goal is to end suffering by ending desire, as stated in the Four Noble Truths. To do this, you have to follow the Eightfold Path, which requires high moral standards and very strict discipline. Mr. Iker, do we need to know all the Four Noble Truths and eight parts of the Eightfold Path? No, almost certainly not, but you should have a general idea about the goals and practices of Buddhists, and more importantly, how Buddhism got to China, and how it spread from China to other parts of Asia. Buddhism, of course, originated in India and made its way to China via the Silk Roads, sometimes through missionaries, but very often through merchants. And this relationship between the trade and the spread of belief systems is also going to be a major continuity throughout AP world history. This had already been happening as far back as the Han Dynasty and really ramped up during the Tang Dynasty in which Buddhism actually became more influential than Confucianism in many ways. So let's look at a few branches of Buddhism that the College Board seems to want you to know a little bit about. Theravada, now this is the most old school original form of Buddhism that focuses on the individual's process of trying to overcome desire and reach nirvana. This one wasn't especially popular in East Asia during our time period, but it did remain popular in Southeast Asia. Mahayana, which means the greater vehicle, turned out to be much more appealing to large groups of people, especially in East Asia, because it did not require all its followers the strict lifestyle of meditation and fasting and denying your desires that Theravada did. A key feature of Mahayana was the belief in Bodhi Bodhisattvas. These are beings that have reached nirvana or got close, but they didn't leave the world. They stayed behind in order to provide assistance for people that needed it on the earth. The last one on here is Tibetan Buddhism. Tibetan Buddhism is known for its use of mantras. Mantras include memorizing and chanting certain sacred texts called sutras. Now, they're not the only ones that do this. They just seem to have more of a greater focus on it. We could go down a really deep rabbit hole about Buddhism, but for our purposes, just keep in mind that Buddhism was 
very popular in China. Buddhism spread from India to China via the Silk Road trade routes, and Buddhism spread from China to other parts of East Asia, like Korea and Japan. Yeah, what about Korea and Japan? I'm glad you asked. I'd say about 90% of the questions that have come up for 1.1 on AP exams are usually about China. But you also need to know a little bit about the other East Asians, and specifically how they were influenced by China. Buddhism is a great example of that. It remains popular in both Japan and Korea today, and it was even more popular during our time period of 1200 to 1450. Buddhism came to China through the Silk Roads. How did it get to Korea and China? I know, Mr. Iker. They got there through China. And by the time it got to them, the versions they got were largely influenced by Chinese cultural traditions. Even the architecture of the temples are similar. A good example of this similarity is the most popular Buddhist sect during the Song Dynasty was called Chan Buddhism, a sub-branch of Mahayana. And the most famous sect of Buddhism in Japan today is called Zen Buddhism. Isn't that the same character? Indeed it is. Zen is Chan, and Chan is Zen. And I'm glad you noticed that they're the same character. Actually, the Japanese literally copied the Chinese characters and then adopted them for their own purposes in their language. Look, it's the same characters. Koreans, too, used Chinese characters in their writing during this time. And it wasn't until about the 1400s that their own writing system, Hangul, became more prevalent. The Japanese also would go on to develop their own writing system. But to this day, it still includes many Chinese characters. Characters. Both Korea and Japan and many other states were attracted by Chinese power and wealth and cultural achievements. Think of China like the sun that all the other states in East Asia revolved around. Much of this was related to the tribute trade system, which we'll talk about in the economics section. And not just East Asia. Vietnam and Southeast Asia was extremely influenced by China during this time period. The Vietnamese elites also adopted the Chinese cultural traditions of Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. They even had a civil service examination system, and their rulers claimed the mandate of heaven. Both the Tang and the Song, as we mentioned, were golden ages of Chinese culture, and this includes a lot of literature, especially poetry. During the Tang Dynasty, the Japanese sent many agents to China to learn as much as they could, learning about their politics, their economy, and their culture, to get ideas. So, not surprisingly, the Heian period in Japan was also a golden age of culture, including literature and poetry. A famous example of this is The Tale of Genji, the world's first ever novel written by the female author Murasaki Shikubu. In general, though, one of the consequences of Chinese influence was that women's prominence in society declined in these neighboring states. For example, in Korea, women's lives became much more restricted as a result of Confucian influence and ideals of filial piety. In some cases, they were even more restricted than women in China. An exception to this is Vietnam, in which women tended to keep a much higher status in society, and they often served as leaders in their communities. Are we done with culture now? Not quite. We still have one more key term, Neo-Confucianism. As we mentioned, the three belief systems of Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism called the San Jiao, existed side by side and often competed with each other, but also influenced each other. Now, during the Tang, Buddhism had become the most dominant. But by the time of the Song, they had come up with a new and improved Confucianism called Neo-Confucianism. Neo-Confucianism also incorporates some elements of Taoism and Buddhism into it. Now, what we call Neo-Confucianism, the Chinese call Li Xue, the study of Li. Uh, Mr. Eichert, is that the same Li as in Ren and Li? No, that Li means propriety. This Li means pattern, or in this case, logic or truth. What is this, Chinese class? Neo-Confucianism combined these three belief systems in an attempt to find the pattern or the logic or truth of all aspects of life. This included studying pretty much every subject, classic literature, philosophy, and much more so than original Confucianism, they also were studying science. In fact, Li Xue today in China is actually the name given for scientific studies. So people studying Neo-Confucianism were also studying scientific subjects. Would all that be included on the civil service examination? Definitely. And can we assume that Neo-Confucianism was also influential in Korea and Japan? Absolutely! Well, it looks like this video is already a bit on the long side, so we're going to actually cut it short right now. So this is going to be a part one and part two. Part two will be economics, technology, and a little bit of social. So I'll put that up here or over there, and you can check that out. Once again, my name is Mr. Eichard. This is the world of Eichard, where we think like the college board and get fives. I'll see you in the next video.